Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 5th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what we think of legislative leadership's push for a PFD-only session. Second, oil prices take a dive. What does that mean for Alaska's fiscal situation? And third, is the university starting down the right road? And now, let's join Michael. Where are we at here? We got the legislature coming hat in hand now to the governor saying, we just couldn't possibly get this done during the regular session. So please, governor, we've treated you so nicely. Please do what we ask with this. What what say you? Well, I think I think you and I and and more than 20 in the legislature are coming at this in the same direction, which is a call. Uh, this particular request for a call um, should be a non-starter. Um, you come at it uh, in 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 the way that that you want you would want it to be very specific uh, and focused, perhaps just on a constitutional amendment. Uh, the 20 and the, the 20 plus in the legislature come at it. Maybe some of them that they're just worn out of, of having special sessions and they want some time with their constituents and some time at home. Um, I come at it a slightly different way. The PFD is the PFD issue is is a subset of a far bigger issue. The far bigger issue is spending doesn't match or revenues don't match spending. And as we've talked about on the program before. Um, it's not just the legislature's budget where revenues don't match spending, even the governor's initial budget, the one where he did cut everything he wanted to cut right. before the legislature got involved. Uh, even the initial budget, uh, uh, traditional revenues didn't match uh, spending. He was about 400 plus odd million dollars uh, short, uh, which he proposed to, to fill in by, by upstreaming uh, 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 property taxes that, that now go to boroughs. He proposed to take those to the state to fill it. So th those were new revenues even in the governor's budget. Uh, the PFD, I mean, a lot of people view the PFD, <laughs> less than 40 in the legislature, but they view the PFD as, as the solution to that problem, that cutting the PFD, taking the, the, the results of the cut um, and moving those over to state revenues that that's the that, that that's the solution to uh, to the issue, but but I don't view it that way, and and I know a number of others don't view it that way. The big issue is revenues don't match uh, spending, so we either got to get spending down, which the governor's tried, uh, and we've seen a, a huge pushback uh, by the legislature, and even the governor's initial budget didn't get it, get it done. So we need to talk about at some point we're going to have to talk about the revenue side. The legislature, what, what, what this request for a call is, is Bryce and, and, and Kathy Giesel's um, effort to limit the call, limit, that, limit the discussion of, of additional revenues uh, to just the PFD, just PFD cuts. That's all they want to talk about. And as you and I have talked about on the show uh, before, that's really the top 20% agenda, right? Because right. They, don't, they, they don't pay any significant amount. Uh, toward the cost of government through PFD cuts. Uh, that's They largely push the responsibility for funding government off on middle and lower income Alaskans. So this call is really the top 20% agenda. It's really limit the, limit the call to the PFD, focus on the PFD. Let's take the, let's take the, um, the, the additional revenues we need out of the PFD, restructuring the PFD, 
um, and, and move on. That's really the top 20% agenda. To me, if we're going to have a call, if we're going to have this discussion, it needs to, the, the, the call needs to be and the discussion needs to be about revenues, not just the PFD, not just that subset, but revenues in total. And, and you know, Senator Showers talked about this as well. He says all things ought to be on the table. He includes oil taxes. I accept that maybe that, that we should be just talking about oil taxes. There's a lot of concern about oil taxes. I don't think oil taxes necessarily should be raised, but they ought to be on the table and and include in that um, uh, uh, taxes, um, income taxes, sales taxes. Let's have a discussion. If we're going to have this discussion, let's have the discussion about the problem itself, which is revenues, not just one subset of it, uh, which is PFD cuts. And and I think this is this is critical. Uh, like I said, for them to come and say, well, we want it just to be this. I mean, first of all, it would be foolish for him to accept their their proposal. You know, just on its face, because again, they've treated him and the minority so poorly in the last uh, in the last year. Uh, you know, this is his opportunity to change the narrative here and make this thing go a completely different way. And as you said, open this up to where it could really, um, uh, I mean, it could really, something could, could really good could come out of it. I mentioned it during the break. Uh, William wrote, you know, for his his thoughts, you know, if you want to make a call, then what needs to be on it is a constitutional amendment to put the traditional PFD formula into the state constitution, the constitutional spending limit, a constitutional amendment to require a vote on any new taxes, and a fully funded PFD from the from the ERA. Those should be the three things on the session. I, I couldn't disagree with that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, we, the, 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 the issue here to me is revenues. The issue is, is getting our spending and our revenues in balance. I mean, the governor very well uh, could put the, his initial proposal of upstreaming the property taxes from the boroughs, the oil property taxes from the boroughs. Sure. With, within within revenues as well. I mean that was his that was his initial proposal on how to how to bring this in balance. Um, that's that's to me revenues is sort of the core issue. Revenues is is sort of unlocks if we can get revenues resolved. Um, uh, it sort of unlocks uh, uh, other issues, uh, the constitutional issues uh, behind it. That's really the core issue to me. We're not we're not going to get this until we get spending and revenues in balance. We're not we're not going to make progress on anything because everybody's going to be continuing to, to revolve around that issue. Um, so to me, the core issue really to, to move forward here is to get revenues and spending in balance. And frankly, Michael, as again, we've talked about on the show, you can do revenues in a way that helps you get very, very much helps you get spending in balance. If you do a flat tax so that all Alaskans have the same skin in the game of spending so that Senator Von Imhoff uh, pays the same percentage of her income that, we're, that she's asking the, the lowest 20 percent to pay of their income, um, then I think, I think spending becomes a different issue. I think the top 20 percent begin to see the problem with spending uh, and begin to push down on spending. Right now, we've got a situation where – uh, the top 20 percent, as long as they're able to push the responsibility for funding to middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, the top 20 percent isn't being affected by spending. So, you know, you can have Natasha out there talking about, oh, we need to do all these good things. Uh, we need to support Alaskans in all these ways. We need to have a, a bigger, a big university. We need to have all these social programs. She's not paying for it. Chris Birch isn't paying for it. Bryce Edgman isn't paying for it. Kathy Giesel isn't paying for it. Uh, uh, Jennifer Johnston, who's one of the co-chairs of the of the of this permanent fund working of the PFT working group, isn't paying for it. So of course they favor uh, additional spending. It makes them popular um, uh, with with a large with with a certain segment of uh, of Alaskans, and they don't have to pay for it personally. Uh, I think I think part of the solution to as we've discussed, part of the solution to the spending problem is getting all Alaskans, all Alaskans uh, equally in the game of, of having to deal with the consequences of spending through through money being taken out of their pockets in the same way. So to me, revenue is sort of the core issue, but it's it's all, re it's revenue 
it's not just one subset of revenue like the PFD. I mean, essentially what Giesel and Edgman are doing is, is asking for the top 20% uh, uh, a version of how revenue ought to be raised. If we were in a different time, you and, and Les Guerra, let's say, was, was Speaker of the House, Les would be saying, well, have, let's have a call on progressive income taxes. That's the way to resolve this. Um, and, and so it's really just one subset. They're pursuing one subset that appeals to their donor class, appeals right. to them personally, and their donor class trying to push that forward. And I just think that's, I just think that's a mistake. Well, and let's so let's talk about this because again, you know, we and you and I have talked exhaustively about, uh, you know, for example, a flat tax. Uh, and I know there's been some criticism that that's what we keep bringing up, you know, as far as, again, the, the most equitable way. So let me just point blank ask you, Brad. I mean, are we at that time now where we need to have some kind of tax in the state of Alaska? Or could we still, with the revenues that are currently coming in, with the forecast for, you know, AEDC talking about the 350,000 barrels of oil that are going to be coming into the pipe in the next two or three years? I mean, are are we at that point where we have to have that external source of revenue, or could we cut back enough over the next, you know, 18, 24 months to where that would not be required? Should we be short-circuiting the discussion with a new discussion of tax revenue on the people of the state? Well, Michael, this is where looking at a 10-year forecast comes in comes into play. When you look at the 10-year forecast, there's really no way that that we cut back spending uh, to the level nobody's proposed, not even the governor's proposed, uh, uh, levels of spending that match traditional revenues. As I said, the governor's proposal was to upstream $400 million out of the out of the boroughs uh, into the state coffers, uh, and that's the way he was going to bring us into uh, into compliance. But that was that only paid for his initial spending level, which was what 3.4 billion or something, somewhere in that range. Um, and now he's and now through through the the rounds that we've gone through through the legislature, spending is up significantly from that level. So the gap is not only is not is not only four hundred million dollars uh, anymore. It's it's significantly uh, significantly greater than that. When you look out at the ten year window at the ten year forecast, th- there is no there is no uh, scenario under which we come back into balance on traditional revenues. And as we'll talk about in the in the next segment, with oil prices going down, it's it's there, there, it really just doesn't happen. Yes, there are new volumes that come on, but those new volumes, in significant part, replace the declines that we have from our existing fields. And a lot of those new volumes are coming on from federal lands, where the royalties uh, go to go to other purposes, uh, go to the federal government, and then through the federal government go to other purposes, then 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 come into state coffers. So again, looking at that 10-year forecast, there's just not a way, uh, even if the governor's proposed initial proposed spending level, there's just not a way where we come back into balance. We are going to have to deal with with additional revenues. We've papered that. We 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 should have been dealing with it since 2012. We papered over it, papered over that by draining our uh, our our savings accounts, draining our fiscal reserves down to where they're approaching negligible amounts. Um, and 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 we've used we've used up the cushion we had uh, through those reserves. So we, we, we are down to the point uh, again when you look at the ten year window. We're, we're down to the point where we're ha- going to have to deal with revenues. Well, and I don't want to be a dog on a bone here, Brad, but I mean I look at our level of spending, and I look at this fact that we're spending. You know the the tens of thousands of dollars we're spending on a per person basis, and I question. I mean, yes, granted, the governor's, even his proposed budget did not get us down into the balanced budget territory. Um, but, I mean, he did say that this is not a, all not all done in one year um, because I'll be honest with you. I know that there's a lot of people in the state of Alaska because of the high cost of living and some of the other issues. If we end up having a state tax on top of everything else, I mean, we will take a hit. And my question is, at $13,000 plus per man, woman, and child in your household, I mean, isn't there room enough to come back to where we were? I mean, uh, uh, I think Craig said in the chat room earlier, you know, the spending really started to get out of control when the oil spike happened in 2009. You know, it, it, can't we just start with the 2008 budget, add a little cost of inflation every year and work backwards from there to find the, the, the good number? Or what, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, remember in 2008, 2009, we still had what? 750,000 barrels production. Right. We're down, we're down to 500,000 barrels production. In, in, in 2008, 2009, we had uh, uh, $100 oil or we had $90 oil. Um, and we had uh, the, the, certainly the equivalent of 90 or the, the inflation adjusted $90 oil at that time. So you had 750,000 barrels, you had $90 oil. You had a, a boatload of revenues. We're down to, we're we're, we're at sixty dollars oil, sixty dollar oil, sixty five dollar oil, maybe seventy dollar oil, uh, as it bounces up sometimes, uh, and we're at about five hundred thousand barrels a day. Now, five hundred thousand barrels a day—that's a lot. It's a lot of progress from where we otherwise were headed in 2014 due to lack of investment. That's a good number compared to then, but it's not seven hundred fifty thousand barrels, and it's not going to be seven hundred fifty thousand barrels. So we're we're not we're not dealing in in the environment where we can where we can tell ourselves we can just go back 2008 2007 2006 uh, and and we'll be fine. The revenues aren't there. The same revenues aren't here now that were that were there then to support even that level uh, of government without without additional revenues. You know, Brad, this 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 whole thing is really. Um... I mean, I, you know, the more we look at this and the more we look at what the government has done in the state of Alaska, um, I mean, I'm I'm a little disheartened because, again, I know, like I said, I know people, plenty of people who would say, boy, if they hit me with a state income tax, whether it's a flat tax, progressive, payroll, whatever, I mean, that could be the final nail uh, in what's going on. I mean, what is the ultimate, I mean, how can't we live within our means of what we're receiving right now, this oil royalty, or is it the fact that production is just continuing to drop that we're going to have to ultimately face this? Well, production isn't continuing to drop. Production's leveled at around 500,000 barrels a day, and we've got these prospects. Uh, if we don't tax them out of existence, we've got these prospects uh, out there that are going to bring on additional production to offset decline. So when you look at the 10-year forecast, I mean, we've got – some we're, we're sort of holding our own on the production side. When you look at the 10-year forecast, I mean, the world's changed on oil pricing. It used to be that uh, uh, that that OPEC could set through fiat could set what the what the price of oil was. Well, with lower 48 shale uh, oil, uh, that's changed significantly. Now the price is capped essentially at the marginal cost of producing uh, shale in the lower 48 of the United States. Um, and so oil prices are are in a different regime uh, than they were back then. So we've we've got we've got uh, production sort of under control. Oil prices are sort are are effectively much lower than than they used to be. And and I keep going back to the governor had a free shot. His first budget, his initial budget, uh, was I get to cut everything I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut the university. I'm going to do. I'm going to cut this. I'm going to cut that. I'm going to cut that. Um, and and his ten year forecast. Um, showed you know how he expected this to play out over the uh, over the over the upcoming ten years, um, and that ten year forecast had a deficit, uh, uh, had a gap uh, against traditional revenues that had to be closed. He closed it through upstreaming uh, uh, the uh, oil property taxes from some of the boroughs, um, and uh, but but he had to have he had to have new revenues um, uh, somehow. So it's, I don't, you know, theoretically you can say, well, the traditional revenues are going to be X and we're only going to spend, we're only going to spend Y and that's how we're going to do it. But even the governor's initial budget uh, didn't do that. When he got, we had a free shot to cut everything that he wanted to cut. Um, it, it didn't get done. Yes, we may bleed people. If we have, if we have a, a, a flat tax, if we have any sort of tax, yes, we may bleed people. But Michael, we're bleeding people now through, through spending cuts. I mean, it's not, it, it, there, there's not, you, you can't say that we're going to cut down to traditional revenue levels. We're not going to have any taxes and we're not going to bleed people. We're going to bleed people through the spending cuts that result from that. I'm not, that's not bad. I mean, we, we build a state, we build a state government we can't afford. And we, and, and part of the process of coming down to what we can't afford is bleeding people uh, uh, that have been supported by excess uh, government spending, but we're going to bleed people. Uh, so we're going to bleed people one way or the other. The question is, question is, what's the what's the, the 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 ultimate balance we get to? And again, going back to the governor's initial budget, 
there isn't enough spending cuts that get us down to traditional revenues over the 10-year window. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, our guest here in the studio. Well, he's not in the studio because this studio is small, but uh, he is on the phone with us right now, uh, writing about all different kinds of things. Brad, anything? we got about 90 seconds here. Anything else you want to cover with the uh, Facebook crowd before we jump back into the top three? Well, Michael, I, I think I, I know it's difficult, but I think people need to wrap their heads around the, the, the revenue discussion. And maybe they maybe some people wrap their, their heads around the, the governor's proposal to upstream uh, uh, the revenues uh, that the oil, oil tax revenues, oil uh, uh, property tax revenues that have been in the boroughs. Maybe other people uh, wrap their heads around other revenue. But we need to be having a revenue discussion. This is a discussion that's going to be had. It's a discussion that's been the last three years. The solution to many is PFD cuts. If it's not, if we're not going to do it through PFD cuts, which I think are bad, the bad wrong way to go. If it's not going to be PFD cuts, there has to be revenue from someplace. We need to be having this revenue discussion. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, look, I see if you gave me the bad, you know, it's the worst of all choices. Do you want a diarrhea milkshake or a poop sandwich? I mean, I, you hate to do it, but the equitability factor of a flat tax does make sense. Um, as far as everybody having the same skin in the game, uh, again, just, you know, all I can hear in the back of my mind is taxation is theft and it's, it's bugging the hell out of me that we've grown our government to such a level that this is where we're at. But <clears throat> I guess that is the nature of the beast at this point. We are, uh, talking about the weekly top three. We just finished number one, which was the PFD and revenues, which takes us on to number two oil prices. And what does it mean? What does it mean? Uh, with Brad Keithley. Brad, where are we at and w what goes on from here? Well, those who follow oil prices or, or just the economy in general or, or the markets in general over the last few days have noticed uh, a significant drop um, in, um, in oil prices. Uh, we had sort of crept back up to the $65, $66, $67 dollar range uh, uh, over a period of time since the last drop. Uh, prices were sort of looking like they were stabilizing there. There had been a couple of events uh, that in the old days uh, would have spiked prices. Uh, the, uh, uh, there were uh, 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 Iranian attacks, Iranian naval attacks against uh, shipping in the, in the Strait of Hormuz uh, in, the, in the Arabian Gulf uh, that, that, was, that were threatening to disrupt uh, the ability to tanker oil out of the uh, Arabian Gulf, which is a, an important source of, of oil, obviously, to the world. Um, and those, and in the old days, those attacks would have spiked oil prices high out of concern that, that something was going to happen uh, to the supply. The market didn't move very much. I mean, the market sort of responded a little bit to those attacks, but, but really didn't move much uh, as the, as the, as the level of, uh, of, of threats have gone back and forth between Iran and the U.S., uh, again, those would have spiked oil prices in the old days, uh, and they didn't move the market very much. The reason was uh, there was a, 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 lot of, a lot of supply uh, in the lower 48, in the U.S. lower 48, coming on through shale. Um, the, the shale industry had restructured its costs. It was, it was profitable, again, investing again uh, in the mid-60s. Um, and mid sixty dollar range, and uh, there was just a lot of comfort that 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 whatever level of a, of disruption that we likely might see in the Arabian Gulf could be covered through U.S. production. Uh, what happened last week was uh, President Trump announced uh, the next set of tariffs against China, announced expanding uh, uh, the tariffs that had already been on a portion of the Chinese uh, imports into the U.S. to all essentially all Chinese imports. And, and there was one chart that I posted uh, last Friday that was just shocking. It just showed oil prices just dropping off uh, the edge. They sort of went into free fall uh, from the $65, $66 range down, uh, almost went below $60 uh, on Friday uh, uh, itself in response to the announced tariffs. And the, and the concern is, concerns on the demand side, the concern is that, that uh, this disruption between trade between China and the U.S., would, would result in uh, lessened demand, uh, lessened economic activity globally, lessened demand, uh, and as a result, take out sort of the demand side of the, of the supply-demand equation in determining uh, oil price. That, has that price slide has continued yesterday. Um, uh, prices dipped below uh, 
$60 into the 50s, we're talking about the Brent, I'm talking about the Brent price. Um, the below $60 into the $50 range, the high $50 range, $59 plus dollar range, um, is sort of bounded up and down. I think the, the official close yesterday was at was in the $59 range. They've come back up a little bit this morning. Um, and as I'm talking, I've got this on the screen in front of me. As I'm talking, they are precisely, Brent crude is precisely at $60 uh, even at the at the moment we're talking. So it's 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 bounding up and down. But but it's but it's taken a significant hit. Um, there was an article yesterday uh, talking about a Merrill Lynch um, uh, 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 projection that if uh, uh, that if <laughs> if China turned to Iran for oil, remember that part of the problem, part of the issue with Iran is that we have uh, we have uh, restricted uh, Iran Iranian uh, oil exports. Uh, through the use of our banking system, but nevertheless put effective uh, sh sanctions on Iran Iranian oil exports, um, it, which has really taken supply off the market and helped, frankly, buoy uh, this price. There was an article yesterday that, that of an analysis, maybe it was Morgan Stanley, but one of the M's, that um, uh, that if, if China turned to Iranian oil, if China essentially broke U.S. sanctions and bought Iranian oil and, and brought that oil, the Iranian oil, back on the market, Oil prices could go down to the $30 range. Could break and go down to the $30 range. Uh, there was another uh, uh, analysis yesterday that if uh, if the tariffs stay in place and China's uh, uh, China's response to the tariffs, and they did respond yesterday by essentially saying they're not going to buy any more U.S. grain for a while until this is resolved, which is a fairly big deal uh, in the in in the U.S. agricultural commodities market. Uh, that uh, if uh, the U.S. sanctions stayed in place and the Chinese response stayed in place for uh, six months, that that or for three months, we could have a recession, a global recession inside of six months. So all of the all of the all of the signs, all of the concerns right now in the market are about lack of demand. They're being generated uh, in large part because of the trade battle between the U.S. and China. It doesn't look like that trade battle is going to res be resolved anytime soon. It looks like with the announcement of additional sanctions, it looks like that trade battle, in fact, is deepening. That's depressing uh, the market, depressing the demand side, um, and and moving oil prices down in a way that uh, that they may stay down for a while. We may see sixty-dollar oil uh, as sort of the as sort of the marker now for a while, instead of the sixty-seven, seventy-dollar oil that that we'd seen before. What is this? What does this spell for Alaska then in this regard? We got uh, well, four minutes. Here. It, it, to, to take it back to the first discussion we were having, uh, it, it takes it moves traditional revenues down. It deepens the gap, uh, not only uh, in the in the governor's initial budget, uh, uh, initial spending plan, but certainly it deepens the gap with the sort of the revised spending plan that we're coming to as a result of the legislative response to the governor's uh, governor's budget, um, and and makes our uh, revenue picture, the Alaska revenue picture, all the more difficult. It could make it also more difficult in terms of, of disincentivizing additional development on the North Slope, at least at the margin. I mean, these price drops have an effect on uh, uh, on the producers and on their willingness to invest uh, capital in additional oil production, uh, and it could slow down some projects um, uh, on the slope, so it could affect uh, the, uh, the the volume side uh, as well. Oil, I mean, oil, as we've discussed on the show numerous times, oil goes up, oil goes down, oil goes back up, comes back down. I mean, oil is a it, it, it's hard to to build your entire life around a certain uh, uh, oil uh, price, but uh, we are seeing things in the market that 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 are pushing oil prices down currently. We're seeing trends that may keep those prices down uh, at a at a lower level uh, for an extended period of time, and and we certainly will see that show up to some degree, e even if it's only affecting price, not affecting volume. It will show up to some degree in terms of a reduction in uh, traditional Alaska revenues, and that reduction will only deepen the gap, deepen the deficit between uh, our uh, spending levels and our uh, traditional revenue levels. 
Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, we got like 90 seconds here. I don't suppose we want to try and squeeze the university discussion into 90 seconds. Uh, if you want, we could keep you over the top of the hour and come back to it, or we could visit it again, whatever you – well, I'll leave it up to you. Well, let's let's, let's take it up at a, at a, at a subsequent time. The 90-second the version is the, the president appears to be on the right track by consolidating the university. And I and I support those efforts to consolidate the university into a single institution. I think he's going down the right road. There's a lot of a lot of additional words I can put around that, but the core of that is I think I think the president's finally got the message, and he's finally taking the university on the right track. Well, and I think I still I still have the irony of the three chancellors still vying for the program where they get all three accreditation still because of course. Their jobs are saved, but you know that I guess that is what it is. It's going to be politics when it's all said and done. Yeah, it is, and and certainly the chancellors are looking out for themselves. I mean, they've come up with with a they they found they they found religion. They're going to cooperate. They're going to get along with each other. Historically, they never have. I think there were a lot of jaws dropping at the Board of Regents meeting where the chancellors were making that claim. We need to resize the university down to what what fits within within our revenue base that's a single university and and i support the chancellor's effort or the president's efforts uh to get down to a single university final thoughts brad i'll let you clean up here on our way out the door if you want uh, anything else uh, on the plate there well i the university i, I the university is a big deal i know there's a lot of ba- a lot of internal battles going on people you know still advocating for uh the consortium approach which is how the chancellors describe their keep the three universities alive. I know the athletics advocates um, who are very vocal um, uh, are, are pushing to keep the keep at least two of the universities going, University of Alaska Anchorage and University of Alaska Fairbanks, because because there's a likelihood when you when you consolidate into a single university, you're only going to have a single set of sports programs and and both the UAA advocates and the UAF ag- advocates are, are pushing to keep uh, keep the separate universities alive. Um, I know that the faculty at, 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 the, at the two universities, the three universities are pushing to keep the, the, the consortium approach, keep, uh, keep some independence and keep, keep a, a demand for, uh, for uh, uh, faculty uh, high, uh, uh, higher by, by having the three university approach. But I mean, the question is if, if we had known at the beginning uh, when we established the university, the type of fiscal constraints we were going to have now, 50 years later, would we have, what kind of university system would we have built? And the answer is, given the, the fiscal box that we've got, given the fiscal constraints we've got currently, we would have built a single university. It would have been a stronger university. Um, uh, by, we will have a stronger university by having a single university as opposed to taking those resources and try to spread them over three separate universities. That's, that's the kind of university you would have built. Um, and and I think that I, I, I've been a big credit a critic of the president. I think he has uh, I think he's uh, not done a great job leading the university uh, up to this point. I think he drug his feet uh, in 2016 when when it was becoming painfully apparent where we were headed, when the legislature gave him direction to consider consolidating the three universities. I think he did a masterful job of the old Ali Ropadope. He just, you know, took the blows, but, but kept on, kept on ticking and kept his three university system um, in, in place. I think he's, I, I, I've been a big critic of him, but now that we've come to the, to the crunch point, uh, I think the president's getting it right. And I think he's the leading the, the board of directors or advising the board of directors in, uh, in going the right direction. And, and I know there's going to be a lot of pushback uh, I anticipate legislators are getting a lot of pushback from the separate universities to keep them, uh, to keep the separate universities alive. I know there's a lot of promises being made about how they'll cooperate and get along and, and, uh, and all work together toward the same end. But, um, but it's just, it, it, we can't afford it. We need to get down to a single structure, a single set of, of management, a single set of administrators, a single catalog of, of courses, um, a, a, a delivery system that that is that that, that delivers education in, in different places, but nevertheless has a single uh, set of, of delivery, and then focus on focus on our strengths. Uh, 
this this sounds a lot like the 2011 Fisher report. That, that's right. because it is. I right. Mean, <laughs> exactly. Well, that's and what the, the Fisher report said we ought to be doing. There's some serious lack of self awareness in this article by Tegan Hanlon. There's a couple comments in here that just make me like roll my eyes. One was a, you know, the the cost cutting, and they were talking about exploring uh, the uh, the idea of selling and leasing some buildings and stuff, and that included leasing the Alaska Airlines Center. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, outstanding debt on that property adds a wrinkle to this. And you're like, you think? I mean, is this why we talked about not building a new arena when there's already an arena in town? You know, and then the whole point of of uh, when he said originally they were talking about uh, that they looked at the, the consolidation back in 2016 and it was advised against. And he was like, well, our house was not on fire then. So we're forced to look at it seriously now. I mean, just serious. I mean. There's there's been problems before. This has been broached. I mean, it was the Fisher report. There was a report in 2008 as well. I mean, there's been a handful of reports that have all said the same thing that since 1976, when they when they split out into three separate universities, that it has been kind of a black hole of, of money suck since then. And uh, you know, the only people who really are excited about it are those who are out there, you know, living large off the idea of three accredited universities instead of a single university. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, there's going to be cer- certainly there's going to be challenges, but people who are concerned, I mean, there's a lot of concern about you know, that, that we're going to close down a bunch of research activities. Well, the, one of the university's strengths is being part of the University of the Arctic. One of the university's strengths is being is is the cold weather uh, uh, and Arctic research uh, that, that it does. The board of directors isn't going to close that down. We're, you build on strengths. I mean, what the Fisher report told you and what common sense tells you is you build on strengths. You build on on things that 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 make you unique, make you attractive. Uh, and I think we'll, we're going to see a lot of these concerns that people have about this is going to be closed down or that's going to be closed down, sort of go away as as people get their mind around a single university and identifying the strengths uh, that we have as a single university. I mean, it's a tough process to go through. But but the president seems to be leading it in the right direction. People say, oh, we ought to be taking two or three years to do this. No, we did this in 2016. We see what two or three years does. It goes to it goes to the rope dove strategy of, oh, I'll think about it. I'll, th- I'll do studies about it. I'll, I'll think about it some more and, and hope to heck it goes away. Hope, you know, legislators forget about it and, and the governors forget about it. So I, I think I think collapsing it into a time frame, a, 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 a constricted time frame is tough. Uh, certainly, but I think it's doable. Um, I would be very concerned if the Board of Regents had, had gone down the consortium model and said we're going to try to keep three universities. I think that would have been just a disaster in the making. But the president recommended and the Board of Regents uh, decided <clears throat> to go head toward this cons- consolidation. Yep. And, I, and, I, and I think we're going on the right track. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board, my friend. Appreciate it. We hope you have a good week, and we will talk to you again soon. Michael, thanks as always for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.